Hello, I'm Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. In this video I am going to remove the front two battery modules from our 2021 Mustang Mach-E GT. The removal procedure for remo removing these modules is the same as for the rest of the modules. So I'm just going to do one because I need to get this car back together and functioning for a class that starts in two days and so <laughs> I got to get this all back together. Um, so I'm going to follow the, the service information step-by-step -step procedure for removing these two front modules and then show you what the cooling plate looks like and uh, how you would replace these modules and then put it all back together, put it back in the car, bleed the cooling system, make sure we don't have any trouble codes and have it ready to go. Okay, let's get started. All right, the first step in battery module replacement is to disconnect the electrical connectors here at the battery energy control module, the BECM. And there is a specific order in which you disconnect these electrical connectors here. So in the service manual, we start with these first four connectors here on the right. You'll notice they have black electrical tape around them indicating that they are low voltage circuits. So we're going to disconnect in order this first one, second one, third one, and fourth one. And so our next electrical connector is this one clear over here on the my left hand side, the left hand side of the or driver's side of the vehicle. And so I'm going to unplug that one. Next. So after disconnecting this connector over here on the left, we wait 10 seconds before we disconnect the rest of the electrical connectors. Notice the rest of the electrical connectors have harnesses that are covered with orange tape. That indicates that those are connected to high voltage circuits. And these are actually the voltage sensing lines that measure the individual cell pack voltages of all 94 cell packs on this battery. Uh, on the GT version, the extended range battery, it only has 94 cell packs rather than 96 that you would have in the uh, standard range battery. All right, our 10 seconds are up. So then the next connector to undo is this one right over here and we will work that way towards the passenger side. So we'll disconnect that one, two, three, four, and five. And the reason we have to disconnect those is the battery energy control module has balancing circuits in there that it uses to balance the individual cell pack voltages. And it's my understanding that you need to depower the battery energy control module in a certain order so that it doesn't think that it has an unbalanced module because you disconnected the wrong connector at the wrong time. Okay, our next step is to disconnect all of the electrical connectors at the battery junction box. But as you saw from my previous video on the high voltage contactors in this junction box, uh, I've already got it disconnected. Obviously, I'm sitting here holding it. Uh, we do not need to remove the junction box. We just have to disconnect all of the electrical connectors that connect to it uh, before moving on with the battery module uh, removal. All right, with the battery junction block already removed, now we are going to disconnect some wire harness brackets that hold our high voltage wire harness in place here inside the, the battery. All right, and then there are two high voltage electrical connectors for the voltage sensing lines at the battery modules that have to be unplugged. Okay, the service information tells us that uh, before flipping this wire harness up and getting it out of the way, that we should cover any 
uh, anything that might get dirt in it or be a possible electrical uh, connector, tape, tape over uh, terminal ends or harnesses or whatever. I have some high voltage uh, little sleeves that I can put on over these two high voltage connectors going to the cables that go to the rear inverter on this battery. There is no voltage on these wires. It's just an open circuit all the way to the back electrical connector because these connected at the battery junction box, which was al is already disconnected and removed. But uh, these are a uh, special service tool for General Motors vehicles years ago, part number EL48569. I really like them because they can slide over a number of things and are rated for high voltages. So now we can tip up this wire harness and just kind of fold it out of the way here and keep it from interfering with our battery module removal procedure. Okay, the next step is to put some sort of an absorbent cloth or towel down inside the battery housing because we're going to, to disconnect the coolant hoses that from our inlet and outlet uh, over here on the front of the battery, there are coolant hoses that come in and connect to each coolant plate all the way down through all uh, six coolant plates on this model. So I'm supposed to disconnect the coolant hoses. So there's one and the other one. Okay. So we've got two coolant hoses right here that transfer, transfer coolant through. All right, now we are supposed to disconnect those from the battery modules. There's a clip right here that holds them in place. Get that out of the way. And then there are two clips, two connections down inside the valley here between the battery modules that need to be disconnected. Okay, so there's a little tab that you pull out and then you press in. We always want to avoid putting anything conductive down inside the battery housing. Uh, we don't want to store any tools on the, the battery, the top of the battery that might roll off and, and make a connection somewhere. And even though these battery modules are only uh, 30 to... Uh, Let's see, this one's, this one's 26 volts between these two points, 30 volts between the next two points. Uh, all of them in series add up to that 380 volts that we added, that we measured in a previous video. So just try your best to not use any conductive tools. There we go. All right, I've pushed in, and now I need to lift up. All right, I've got some non-conductive needle nose pliers here from Snap-on. I'm going to grab onto the hose so I can lift up. At the same time I use this other screwdriver to push in. There we go. Okay. So there's one connection disconnected for the coolant hose. And now we have one more. Okay, here are the coolant hoses. They just have some quick connect, quick release uh, coolant hose connections on them. And we will set these off to the side also. There we go. All right, got a little bit of coolant in the coolant plate, it looks like. Okay, our next step is to remove this bus bar right here that goes from the positive output of battery module or, or array module uh, number one, positive to the negative of array module number two. 
So this is our positive to negative uh, connection, putting these modules in series with each other. So we are putting uh, 26 volts in series with roughly 30 volts nominal with that bus bar. So that bus bar needs to be removed. We're going to open the, the cap that exposes the high voltage connection there and then remove the nut. There's also another bus bar over here that does the same thing between modules 11 and 12. And so I'll remove both of those next. All right, it is not a stud and nut, it is just a bolt. So we'll take that out. Okay, then we will lift off the bus bar right here. That's our conductive bus bar between module one and module two. All right, we'll do the same thing over here for modules 11 and 12. And here's the bus bar between module 11 and 12. Okay, our next step would be to remove the high voltage battery positive cable and the high voltage battery negative cable that went to the junction box but I have already removed that as part of my video demonstration on how the junction box works. So we will skip those two steps. And now we are ready to remove some hold down bracket bolts. We have a hold down bracket right here, 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 and here. And it looks like there are three bolts in each one and we need to get those out. It tells us to loosen each bolt a little bit before removing all of them so that damage won't occur to the threads if there was one that was slightly off. By the way, we're supposed to close the battery positive and negative covers as soon as we're done removing those bus bars and I forgot to do that. so. There we go. That's just an extra layer of safety uh, built in. These bolts screw into an aluminum bracket and you want to be very careful that you don't just use an impact wrench of some sort to zip them out of there because you can damage the threads quite easily. Okay, I've got all the brackets off and the next thing to do is to remove, there are three bolts on each end of each module. These have a Torx Plus head on them so it takes a special socket to remove them. Let me get these out of the way. Big long bolt. Okay, our next step is to come in with these battery array lift adapters. And these are going to bolt right to these aluminum end pieces where we just removed those three bolts each. And there's four of these, one for each end of the two modules. And so let's get those installed. Okay, here we go. There's already some threaded holes in the modules that were unused, except for uh, the wire harness bracket, the little plastic Christmas tree plug that plugged in there to hold the harness in place. Okay, the bolt torque on these adapter bolts is 119 inch pounds or 
five Newton meters. Okay, our next step is to bring in our big crane adapter. That's a Ford special service tool, part number 414-016. For this kit, it has these four lift adapters and then the big I-beam that comes across. This is the same tool that I showed you in the battery removal video that lifted the entire battery. Okay, we're going to align this lifting bar with those lift adapters. Okay, as a safety precaution here, my battery lifting table is not as large as the official Ford one that you're supposed to use. And because it's not as large, this battery is kind of balanced on the lifting table. And if I'm going to lift out, I don't know how much weight here uh, to remove these two modules, uh, it could cause the, the balance of the battery on my lifting table to get off center and possibly even have the battery fall on the floor. So I'm going to lift the table up just a little bit and put one of my uh, shop stools under each corner of the battery to keep it stabilized so it doesn't rock off. I'm going to lift our adapter back up. There we go. Now we'll lift the battery a little bit. All right, battery's gonna come down and we're not going to put the full weight of the battery on those shop stools, but we are going to let it touch it so that it is stabilized. There we go. Okay, coming down. All right, now each of these little lift adapters have this little arm that swings over and then we tighten down the bolt that holds it in place on each side on that I-beam. So now we can tighten the bolts down to their proper torque. Same as the ones below. Okay, we are finally ready to lift these two battery modules out. You are always supposed to lift two out at a time, otherwise you'll damage the cooling plate down below because the modules are sitting on a thermal paste that doesn't want to let go and so it'll bend and damage the cooling plate if you just try to remove one. So the cooling plate has to be replaced for it, either replacing one module or two modules. Doesn't matter, you got to pull them both out and remove the cooling plate and replace it. So let's let's take this up. The reason we need a crane is so that we can lift straight up and then bring it straight back down later to set it on that thermal paste. So let's bring it up just a little bit and see, see where we're at. Feels good. There we go. Just like that. On the side of the battery, it has 4P7S, which means there are four parallel pouch cells per cell group, and there are seven series cell groups in this one module. Uh, you can see the coolant plate is this very thin piece right here. And if you look in there, you can see the two coolant connections for the battery. Now let's take it up higher so we can see underneath it. Oh, 
Okay, as you can see underneath that cooling plate, uh, you can see some little indentations and some alignment dowel holes that line up with some uh, dowels here in the bottom case. Uh, the coolant is going to come in. It looks like on the front side closest to us in the camera and then go around and go out on the back side. You can see a dividing line down the middle. I know there's a name for all those little bumps inside, uh, but it slows the coolant down and guides it and directs it around so that they can have a good thermal transfer of heat from the battery modules. All right, if we look here in the battery tray, the battery housing here, you can see there are six 12 alignment dowels that this battery has to line up with. Uh, that cooling plate lines up with that also. I'm not going to remove the cooling plate because I don't have a replacement one and I don't have the proper, proper thermal uh, paste that goes in there. But that thermal uh, paste has to be installed at a certain depth and at a certain location. There are these templates here for that thermal uh, paste. And so notice there's a short template over here for the two front modules, like the two I just removed. And then the rest of the modules are longer modules. And so, and so you would put a new cooling plate or cold plate, as it says here on the, the template, you would put a new cold plate down and that would fill up the entire area here. And then you would use this template to set down and align with those dowels and put the thermal paste, fill up these slots in the template with this two-part thermal paste that you mix uh, as you extrude it uh, out of the cartridges. And then you move it to the other one and, and do the same thing. So we have to install thermal paste to transfer the heat from the modules. Now this battery, according to the window sticker on the, on the Mustang, uh, can support up to 150 kilowatt charging. And I believe part of that uh, is because of the cold plate and the thermal paste that is being used. Uh, LG Electronics is the one that makes these battery cells and, and batteries is my understanding. And that's the same company that makes it for the Chevrolet Bolt EV. But the Chevrolet Bolt EV doesn't, didn't use a thermal paste. It used these thermal pads. And these thermal pads are tacky. They will stick to the big cold plate that the bolt has, one giant cold plate going all the way up and down uh, the, the bottom of the battery tray. And then you put these thermal pads on underneath each battery module. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this isn't as good of a thermal transfer uh, as the thermal paste that's used here uh, in the Mach-E. But I could be totally wrong. That's not my field. I'm just speculating. This is the fifth video on this Mach-E and the high voltage disabling, the high voltage components, battery removal, contactor operation, and now battery module removal. And I'm not going to show you the installation. It's just opposite of this. Plus, I'm in a hurry and shooting videos takes a long time. I've got to, as I mentioned before, I've got to have this car back together. Um, for a class that starts in less than two days. And so I'm going to put this back together and get it back in the car. And then I will come back and show you the coolant bleeding procedure. Uh, there's a special vacuum bleed procedure that you need to go through to purge all the air out of all these cold plates and all of the coolant lines and everything that we've disconnected. We have actually drained both uh, coolant reservoirs under the, the hood of this Mustang. Okay, time to put it back together.
okay, I've got the battery completely installed, all of the coolant hose connections, all of the electrical connections, all the bolts torqued. It's ready to go other than I need to put coolant in the systems. We've got two coolant bottles, as you can see here under the, the hood. This one right here, uh, Ford calls them degas bottles. This one is for the motor electronics. And so that is the inverters for the front and the rear electric motors and all of the other high voltage electronics that are under the, the front trunk area here, the, the luggage compartment area. I have removed the luggage, luggage compartment so we can see a little better what's inside of here. Uh, the coolant degas tank in the back is specifically for the battery. Now, if you recall, at the front of the battery, there were four coolant connections. Two of those went to the battery, and that's off of this rear degas bottle. The other two went back to two more hoses that connected to the rear drive unit. The, let's see, Ford called it the electronic rear axle drive, the ERAD. So that is fed off of this bottle. And so we need to... Uh, put coolant back in these. Ford says to use any commercially available vacuum refill tool to pull the air out and then let atmospheric pressure push the coolant back in. And so a uh, vacuum kit that I've had for years is this Mighty Vac uh, cooling system test and refill kit part number MV4525. I've probably had it for 12 years works great. So you need an adapter to work with these coolant degas tanks. This particular one is from Snap-on and it is part number TAB10052. And so I'm going to remove the coolant reservoir cap and put this adapter on and then that lets me use the adapters that came with the Mighty Vac kit to put the vacuum refill uh, adapters on. Okay, I've got the snap on adapter, the Mighty Vac adapter, and then a vacuum gauge. And then a hose over here to hook our compressed air to to create the vacuum. And then a hose right here to pull good new clean coolant into the reservoir. So now we're going to hook the compressed air hose to this and pull a vacuum. Okay, here comes the compressed air. Okay, the instructions tell us to disconnect the hose going to our vacuum venturi here and to watch the gauge for 30 seconds to see if the vacuum level de decreases numerically. And if it does decrease, then we have a leak somewhere. So this checks the external hoses and the hoses inside of the battery housing itself on part of the reassembly procedure of the battery before putting the upper cover on the service information told you to do a leak test of the cooling system to make sure that there's no leaks so that you don't have to pull it back apart and it looks like we have no leaks uh, i did not do that um, and i lucked out this time
It also told us to do a leak of the cover where you use an evaporative emissions leak tester to put compressed air or nitrogen inside of the battery housing and then check for leaks with Snoop liquid leak detection that creates fine little bubbles if there's a leak anywhere. Uh, but I don't have all of the equipment to do that yet. There are leak test adapters that you have to put on to plug every electrical connector and almost every one of those costs around $500. And we have five on the front and one on the rear. So that's <laughs> almost $3,000 for ridiculous adapters. And so I'm trying to find actual electrical connectors, which is all they are, electrical connectors full of RTV. Um, and I've found about half of them now off of uh, wrecked vehicles and uh, eBay wire harnesses and stuff. So as soon as I get all that, then I'll, I'll do a leak check uh, video. But for now, um, for our classroom purposes, I, I skipped that. All right, it looks like we're holding just fine. So now we are going to take the tube that goes to our coolant, or our new coolant, and allow it to allow that vacuum that we put on the system uh, to, for lack of a better term, pull in the coolant, but it's, it's really atmospheric pressure pushing it in. So let me get the coolant. The only coolant approved for this Mach-E Mustang is the Motorcraft yellow premix 5050 coolant. And this is premixed with deionized water. Please do not mix any other coolant. Don't mix, uh, don't put tap water in here. This is a special coolant that uh, reduces corrosion inside of the, the system. And it's also a, a special non-conductive coolant with the deionized water uh, mixed in with it. The coolant you use should always be brand new, never, never from a, a bottle that's been opened before. Always use new coolant. All right, so we are going to put the hose down in this to let it pull the coolant. The instructions tell us to set the coolant bottle higher than our adapter over here. And then there's just a little shuttle valve that you push to one side on that adapter. Here it goes. As you can see, it's pulling in the coolant. We're refilling that coolant reservoir. I got to watch the coolant level on this gallon jug here to make sure we don't run out and pull air in instead. So there's a minimum and a maximum level on these coolant expansion tanks. And we are going to fill it up to the maximum, if not a little bit more. All right, it's full right there. So I'll push the shuttle valve back. This method, once again, removes the air from all of those cooling plates and all the hoses and everything and replaces all that air with coolant. So we are up to our maximum level on the coolant reservoir. So now we'll do the same thing over here well, that was our battery coolant reservoir. We'll do the same thing here on our motor electronics reservoir. So I'm going to lift the hose out of the gallon jug here of, of coolant and let it pull in what's left in the hose. There we go. And that gets rid of our any residual vacuum also. Okay, let's do the same thing to this other reservoir.
we're getting some pretty good bubbles. <laughs> Down to 20 inches of vacuum. We can usually hit about 22 at this elevation. We're at about 4,600 feet. There's 21. All right, we'll watch the gauge and see if there's any decay. That looks pretty good, but our bottle is already full, so it's not likely that we're going to take very much. We'll try it anyway. Yeah, it's, it's taking some. All right, that looks plenty full at the moment. So I'm going to set this over here. Okay, after refilling both coolant expansion tanks, there is a scan tool function called BECM Coolant Filling and Bleeding Procedure. And this is a three-step procedure with a scan tool that takes an hour. Now, I'm not going to make you wait an hour, I'm, but I'll show you the screenshots as I go through this procedure. And what happens here is since we have two different coolant loops, one for the battery and one for all the motor electronics and everything else, uh, power electronics out here under the hood, um, there's a coolant pump for each uh, loop, and then there's a mixing valve that has to be switched, a four-way mixing valve and a three-way mixing valve. And all of those valves have to be cycled to make sure that we get all the air out. And every time I've done this, the coolant reservoir, the coolant level in the reservoir always drops. And so even though I think I'm done right now, it looks like I'm done, I'm not because I'm only on one section of each of these cooling systems. So there's these switching valves that you have to switch and then let it uh, pump coolant and, and get any air bubbles out that still might be there. And that is all done with this automated procedure on the scan tool. So let's get started with that. Okay, so here on the computer with the Ford Diagnostic and Repair System software, the FDRS, I'm going to select BECM cooling system filling and bleeding from the toolbox. So I'm going to click on run. As you can see here, it gives us a description of what is going on. This function is used to purge air from the cooling system following a coolant repair or coolant top off. This procedure will take a long time to complete. Please disable your computer screensaver in sleep mode. Connect, a computer, connect the computer to an external battery charger. Turn on the vehicle, place the vehicle in park, turn off the climate control air condition. The system must be filled with a commercially available vacuum assist cooling system filler, which we have done. Install the vacuum assist cooling filler and follow the manufacturer instructions to fill the system. We've done that, so I'll click continue. Okay, so now it's going to check HPCM DTCs. Uh, I don't know what these DTCs are for. I suspect it is for cooling pump problems or coolant switching valve problems. So we'll read the codes. There are no codes. We will continue. Now it's going to read the battery energy control module for a whole bunch of trouble codes that might be present if there is a problem. And we check those. It doesn't have any of them. Now it tells us to turn off the vehicle. Okay, the vehicle is off. Now it tells us to, to now it tells us to turn on the vehicle to the ready to run state and turn off the climate control. So we have to have the ready light turned on 
which means we need the brake pedal depressed and hit the power button at the same time. Step one of three. Step one, running routine, duration of procedure, 10 minutes. And it's got a little bar graph going across that gives us our time remaining. Confirm the coolant pump is running by feeling for a vibration at the pump. Watch for air bubbles in the coolant expansion tank reservoir. Monitor the level of the reservoir and continue adding coolant as necessary and maintain the coolant level at the max line in the degas bottle. Okay, as you can see here, our coolant reservoir has been drained on our motor electronics, so we'll allow more to pull in. I can hear the pump. All right, I've lost vacuum now. Now I'm just going to pour it in. The coolant is very bubbly. Uh, once it settles down, it's a nice clear yellow color. But this looks like we're almost halfway through our 10 minute procedure on our motor electronics degas system uh, refill. It looks like our rear reservoir for the battery coolant has dropped a little bit also. So I'm going to top that off while we are waiting the 10 minutes. Okay, it looks like it's moved on to step two now. Running routine, duration of procedure is 20 minutes. And then when it gets to step three, it's a 30 minute routine. So I've topped off, more than topped off the battery degas tank. And that's because every time I've run this, it drops uh, even more by the end of the procedure. Yeah. That sounds like it might be done. The pump quit pumping. Aha, step three. All right. Test will resume. DTCs will be checked. If no concerning DTCs are set, the routine will com the, the routine will run and complete in approximately 30 minutes. Okay. So now we're reading HPCM DTCs. It says it's complete. There are none. Now BECM DTCs. It's complete. There are none. Turn off the vehicle. Okay, the vehicle is off. Turn on the vehicle to the ready run state and confirm or turn climate control Turn off climate control. So back to the ready mode. Step three of three. 
Running procedure, duration of procedure, 30 minutes, approximately. All right. We will let this run until it completes. And then we'll double check the coolant level in the degas bottles to make sure that we're up to the maximum level. Okay, that's it for this Mustang battery project. Um, it's all back together and ready for my class on Monday. My uh, 17th boot camp, hybrid and electric boot camp. Uh, I have seven more of those scheduled for 2023. Uh, see this website link at the bottom of the page if you are interested in attending. Uh, coming up next, I still have two more videos, at least two more videos to do on the Mustang Mach-E. I have the rear drive unit and the front performance drive unit back here on a bench. And uh, we will take those apart and explore them and uh, find out what's unique and cool about those. So thank you for watching and have a good day.